I think stigma is it's part of our mission is for 59 years is to stamp out the stigma. Um, and it, we have a lot more work to do in this. Um, too many families, and we know because we have a family education group, we have a family support group, too many families suffer in silence. Uh, now, we know what the overdose rate is, we know what uh, the arrest records are, uh, and a lot of families tend to skew some of that data because th they don't want the judgments. What is the judgments? Well, prejudgment, the prejudice of, I must have failed somehow as a parent, and that's not the case. That's not the case. Um, I think a lot of us who are somewhat older than adolescents remember the whole uh, epidemics in the 80s and 90s where, um, you know, if you did drugs, you were closely identified as a criminal. And that's not the case. Uh, I'm thinking of the 80s crack epidemic and this and that. And um, This disease knows no class or race or socioeconomic. Uh, it afflicts all people, genders. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to talk more about that as people come forward and say, you know what, and even parents, uh, I was a PTA, I was a Little League coach. I mean, this happens across the board. And uh, I think somewhere along the line, that judgment or stigma got imposed on substance users that if you use drugs, that it must be a moral failing somehow. And it's not. This is a disease like any other disease. Uh, you know, and there's a host of reasons that causes it. But oftentimes it's not, well, period, it's not a moral failing. I want to just reiterate, which we say often here, substance users are not bad people trying to get good. They're sick people trying to get well. And we know neurologically things are happening with uh, the substance using brain. We know physiologically that the body gets consumed with um, and becomes dependent through tolerance. We know psychologically that one's thoughts get skewed around this. So this is truly a disease, according to the American Psychiatric Association. It's in the book. It's been recognized as a medical disorder as well. Um, but yet we're still struggling over, if you're a drug addict, then that must be some moral or uh, societal failing. And that's not the case. We do know, even though we're learning a lot every day, we do know about genetic predispositions. And it's not so much for addiction per se as it is for obsessions and compulsions. Uh, and we know, uh, there's an old saying, you know, uh, you, know f you want a family history, you shake the family tree and down come the bottles. Like in social work, we tend to do genograms. And you could see that oftentimes that this is a genetic predisposition and sometimes it'll skip a generation, but you could see that alcohol dependence, substance dependence, obsessions and compulsions often is riddled throughout a family history. And they have isolated the gene. Now, you could talk to a, a neuroscientist better than a social worker about that, but um, we need to come to the forefront as healthcare professionals, as a society, and recognize this for what it is. It's one of the few diseases that we tend to put the onus on the individual that they've done this to themselves. Uh, you know, uh, I also hear all the time, well, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the few diseases that tells you don't have a disease. Well, there's lots of diseases that tell you don't have a disease, you know. Uh, I think the stigma that people suffer in silence, that they think that it is a reflection on the family, uh, that the general public views substance users as, uh, and you could fill in the stigma there, the dirty, uh, uneducated, uh, a criminal element. None of this is true. Some of the symptoms that play out in substance use disorders don't play well with our societal norms. People do tend to acquire resources, sometimes that aren't theirs, to fuel their drug of choice or their obsession and compulsion. So sometimes they do take things that aren't theirs, but that's by sickness. Uh, we know because we have a relapse prevention group here. We have young people and older people in recovery from alcohol or su other substance abuse. They sit there and rub their heads and they say, I can't believe what I put myself through. I can't believe what I did to myself and my family and my loved ones. I can't believe I sold my personal belongings. I can't believe I sold myself for money. So this is how we know it's a disease. Uh, and I think society, and, and maybe it starts from the top, from, you know, from the government on down, that you know, we haven't addressed this as, a com as communities and as a nation yet. Um, when you talk about how have we been dealing with the substance use crisis in America for 40 years? One way, the prison industrial complex. Sheriff DeMarco, certainly Nassau County Jail, we work with both county police forces and sheriff departments. They'll tell you 80% of the people there are there directly or indirectly because of substance use or other mental health problems. Are we building more drug rehabs? Are we funding more agencies to combat addiction? Or are we building more prisons? We're building more prisons. So um, I think there needs to be a major shift in policy, 
in perceptions. How do we do that? Families come forth. People in recovery come forth. Um, there was a great film that sparked a national, a national movement in, uh, you know, I Am Not Anonymous and Anonymous People. It was a film by Greg Williams. I know you were involved with that. Asking people, the more than 20 million people in recovery living in the United States, to come out and say, I am a person and I'm in recovery from alcohol and substance use problems. Now, if you get 20 million people showing up on the White House steps or on the Capitol lawn, that's a movement that can have great influence over policy, great influence over uh, public opinion, and it, it would probably ultimately destroy the stigma. And more, there are more, believe me, this room itself is filled on Saturday mornings with loved ones and family members who have people that are currently in the throes of this, this obsession and compulsion, this psychiatric illness called substance use disorders. And they come here, and I wouldn't say they huddle in silence, but they're, they're rallying support from one another. They're realizing that this is not a plague on the family. It is a disease that has a cause, or what we call etiology, why it happened, how it progressed, and more importantly, how we make it better. So this is something we haven't really stressed during this interview, but this is very much a family illness. This impacts the entire family dynamic. How husbands and wives get along, or two guardians, whoever they may be, right? How loved ones get along within the family dynamic. How siblings get along when one of the other siblings is currently in the throes of this sickness. All of the family dynamics get upset. And I have to tell you, families need to get educated if they are living in the throes of this. There are things like boundaries, codependency, that without education, that sometimes what people want and what people need can be juxtaposed. So I strongly encourage uh, family members to get educated and to get counseling themselves, not for their loved one, for themselves, because this is truly a family illness, and that's very, very important. So the more people are open and talking about this, um, there is shame and guilt that comes with substance use for the user. Sometimes that gets um, uh, projected onto the family, or sometimes the family projects it onto the user. It becomes this whole dysfunctional relationships. Um, but I think as a, as, a, as a Long Island, as a state, as a society, as a nation, we need to talk more openly and honestly about what addiction is as a psychiatric illness, what are some of the prescribed treatments. We need to take a look at just incarcerating, incarcerating, incarcerating our way out of this problem. Um, we incarcerate more people than any other country on earth, largely in part because of the substance use crisis that has been raging for 40 years. And now, listen, the drug issue is on the table with medical marijuana, with uh, prescription medications, you know, that continue to get released, palcohol, you know. Um, substance use, for better or for worse, is, has always played an intricate part in American society. What we haven't done uh, is talk about what are the limitations that it's going to have in the way of a detrimental impact on American society. And I think we still haven't had open dialogues about what addiction is and who gets afflicted. And we all know somebody. You know, and you could think back. I mean, I'm not here to comment on uh, campaigns, but I'm old enough to remember I, I, I tried it, but I didn't inhale. And now we have elected officials in, of the highest offices. Be like, I've done them all. Let's move past it. So we are talking more openly and honestly about drugs, but we need to still talk openly and honestly about how it's impacting American families on a day-to-day -day basis. And more importantly, what are the proposed solutions beyond incarceration? And I'm hopeful. You should know that every service that we offer here for 59 years, mind you, not only for the substance user, him or herself, but equally for the family. So I encourage families to talk openly. We have uh, a group that's headed by uh, a woman, unfortunately, who had a monumental loss, but it's called the Push Movement, the People United to Stop Heroin. They have been a driving force of not only exercising some of their own grief and loss for a greater good, but they have there been a driving force in the way of policy shifts uh, in the county and state and even on the federal level. So we encourage people that, you know, get involved. You know, if you have a loved one that's either in recovery or currently in the throes of this, God forbid you've lost someone, we, we can all speak out because this impacts us all.